everybody. This is a little deal we call here at Victory Church Pathways, Bible reading with Brother Todd. And if we've never got to meet, well, I'm Brother Todd. And I'm senior pastor here at Victory Church down in the big city of Scurry, Texas. I'm glad we've got to find each other today out here on the internet. And um, what we do in this little deal called Pathways, just read through the Bible together. Uh, we kind of put this out. Our members, regular attenders, catch it every week. And if you're new to it, I hope you'll be able to catch up with us as well. You can go to our website, victorychurch.ch, and uh, you can find the, the back uh, the backlog. We started in the book of John. We read kind of a chapter, chapter two a day, uh, uh, once a week. Um, now, we were off for a good while because of the holidays, and when we came back, well, I read through John 11 again. In fact, if you watched it last week, uh, I said, I feel like I got deja vu. This sounds awful familiar, some things I was saying. Well, as a matter of fact, they told me, but Todd, you read through John 11 twice. So I'm not going to go through John 11. We're going to be in John 12. But you can go back through and, and, and pick back up and catch with us. Everybody, we run anywhere between 25 to 45 minutes long every time we do one of these things. Again, I'm going to be reading through from the New King James translation. If, you want to just catch it exactly word for word. You're going to need one of them in your hand as we read together. If not, just kind of follow along uh, as best you can. And uh, glad all you guys are out there. So without further messing around, let's get to it. John chapter 12, verse 1. This is where, where most of the book, half the book of John is about the really the final hours of Christ. And uh, so starting here in, in chapter 12, we see really the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, here on the on the earth running up to the cross and ultimately the resurrection we're going to find ourselves in what on what's called palm sunday and you've probably seen or at least heard that term okay and uh you'll see where it kind of picks up its its idea here in just a minute but uh but that's kind of this is about the time frame uh that we're in so six days it says verse one before the passover Jesus came to Bethany. Now, that's where Lazarus, okay, you know who he had just raised from the grave. I read through it there twice in John 11. Where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served. Now, if you like to write things down in your Bible, write over to the side there, Luke 10. I'm going to go off memory here. I think it starts about verse 38-ish or so, Okay. And you're going to see the story of Martha serving and being very overwhelmed. And you're going to see that's where Jesus told he prioritized worship over work. But there's a, there's a great lesson to be learned there. When Martha learned how to prioritize, okay, you see her here serving. And you say, Brother Todd, what's the big deal? Well, last time we hear about Martha serving, she got a foul attitude about it. And then th there's no mention of it here. Okay, so it's a it's a good it's a good thing to go look at. Okay, uh, you find over in Luke ten, but here, in fact, she's serving a bigger group. She doesn't have any complaints. When you're being fed through worship, work does not become a drudgery, but work will become a drudgery if you're, you're not if it's emptying you. And there's two things that'll empty you, boys and girls. There's sin and service. And sin obviously will empty you out, but service will empty you out as well. And you have to renew your strength. We have to exchange our weakness for his strength. And that primarily comes in in worship, in spending time with the Lord, as you're doing right now in the Word and in prayer. Okay, the Lord, Lord's good enough to fill us up. So Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, a spice, very expensive, um, and she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And Mary was the worshiper, right? Jesus told Martha, he said, Mary's chosen that good part and it will not be taken from her. Wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. So you see her devotion. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, the, to wash somebody's feet is about as humbling a thing as anybody can do. And she spared no expense in doing it and then dried his feet with her hair. But one of the disciples, oh, Judas of Surrogate, okay, Simon's son, saw, John tells us who would betray him because that's coming, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, let's just see what old John says. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box. 
and he used to take what was put in it. I don't know if they knew that then, but they sure knew it later. So what, what's going on here? Here is the, the deception of trying to sound religious while he's actually sinning. And what he was really upset about was that that money did not go into, into that box because he wanted to steal from it. He wanted to embezzle some of it. And he used spiritual sounding reasoning behind it. I tell, you, I tell people this all the time. Y'all bear with me if you don't know me. If you know me, you, you've heard me say this. If you're going to just sin, leave God out of it. It's bad enough to sin. But what's worse is when we spiritualize uh, or try to put some angle on sin. It's like, if you're going to, again, this would be dead wrong, but let's say you're going to manipulate people. You're going to misuse people, okay? If you do that, you don't do it in the context of the church, okay? You take like all this, all this terrible stuff goes on, molesting all these children and all those kinds of things. Guys, that's bad enough, but when you use the guise of the church and you use spiritual leadership, I'm telling you what, apart from the blood of Christ, there's a bad place in hell coming for these people who use the name of Jesus to do wrong. And again, if you're just really considering the things of Christ, I know there's a lot of problems in the church. Guys, that's just sin. It's just sin. It's not Jesus. There's a lot of people running around under a flag of Jesus that's just doing the flat wrong thing, okay? And uh, uh, for those of y'all out there that's preachers and stuff, that's why you have to be so intentional and you have to, uh, you, you, uh, the old preacher told me one time, this brother pastored uh, First Assembly of God Church in Kaufman, Texas, our brother Council, for 40 something years. And brother Council was not only a, a wonderful preacher and a pastor, but he was a really good businessman and probably owned as much real estate as anybody ever saw around. And he told me when I was young, he, we were talking about something, they had cheating him on something. And, uh, and the city, something, I don't remember what it was. And he said, Well, Todd, he said, you know, when you when you marry the young and you bury the old, you're gonna leave a lot of money on the table. And what he meant by that was is you have to you have to be above reproach in everything you do because everything you do gets tied back to to the church. To the church. Like me, I, I always have my hand in something. I like to have my hand in something outside of just church. I like, you know, I don't make no money at it, but I like to play. I got a little sawmill I run around on, I run some cows different stuff like that well uh used to used to uh, uh used to ride up horses i'd buy horses cheap i'd, I'd ride them up my settlement and they're all around here guys always tell you if you won't buy a horse you holler at brother todd brother todd will sell it to you cheaper well i had to because well, i can't haggle i'm not gonna haggle somebody down i pay a price whatever somebody offers i either want it or i don't because i it can't be that guy's using his position in the church. It's like there's not one business deal I do or would ever do that involves the connection I have with the church, you know. And uh, and you'll see people do that, guys. It's just wrong. You have to you have to watch it because one of the world's watching. The world should watch, and there should be a difference. Here was a man Judas who who was around Jesus, okay, and everybody trusted him. Look, he had the money box. I don't know about your church, but we don't have the sorriest people we got as treasurers. We got our most trusted trustees, i.e. trustees, okay, that are signing checks. Why? Right? Because he's trusted. He's trusted. And uh, nobody, when Jesus said, one of y'all is going to betray me, nobody said, uh, I bet it's Judas. They all ask, is it me? Right? But so he, so he, he, was, he was using the, the, the cause of Christ to fill his own pockets. That's a lot of money. 300 denarii was basically a denarii is a, what a normal worker, let's say just a good skilled worker, would make a day in the Roman Empire. It was a day's wage. So basically, you're about 300 days a year, you I mean, you're talking more than a year's wages here, is what was in that box. Okay? She broke it, poured it all out. She didn't measure back her offer. The old brother said in that song, he said, you know, if you're still measuring out your offerings, you don't know what Jesus is worth yet. You don't know what Jesus is worth yet. I tithe. I give offerings. I want to be. I want to be the. I want to be the most sacrificial giver in this church. In fact, I want to be the biggest giver in this church. But we're talking about come more money to do that. But you, you know, you giving in the kingdom is a blessing. It really is. And I know he said, "Brother, you're all you preachers always after money." I tell you, look, I learned it the hard way long before I was ever preaching that the that it's all the Lord's. 
It's all the Lord's, and the Lord will not be outgiven. Now, I don't give to get. The Lord don't owe me a thing. The Lord bought me a Calvary. He owed everything I own is anyway, right? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I've got a few of them. It's, it's the Lord's, and, 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 and you can't outgive the Lord. Uh, uh, and God, if, if you will give, God will give you the capacity to get. I'm just telling you, I've never seen people that are spiritually gifted in giving and people that just give, that, that do without, that are doing miserable in this world. David said, I've, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. I'm just telling you, God makes a way. God makes a way, you know. And uh, uh, you, you, get, you either love God or love mammon. Right? And I'm just telling you, oh, oh, Judas, man, he sold Jesus out for some silver, right? He, he got his mind off in the wrong place. Right, Mary's heart was on Jesus. He did. She was anointing him for his burial. He, she didn't even know it. She's just trying to love on Jesus. And and if you'll look in the Bible, Jesus never tells people stop worshiping him. Worshiping him. And part of the reason is we're created to be in a worshipful relationship with our God. We're created to be one in Him. But anyway, I I've been talking too long. Um. So verse seven, Jesus says, "Leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial." For the poor you have with you always, but me you don't always have. And right there, he, he, he establishes the priority of, of worship over works. It's a good thing to take care of poor people. But what Jesus was telling them was, there's going to be poor people on this planet from now on, but I, as a son of God in physical human body, I'm only going to be here for a little bit longer. And uh, there's, there's, there's a balance. There's a balance. Churches are always striving for it. Pastors are always striving for it. Christians are always striving for it. You look at Jesus, he's the most balanced human being that ever lived. Be balanced. Be ba Those of you that are pastors, look at your church budgets. Look for, look for places where you're out of balance. Yes, benevolence is an important thing. We do it here. Thank God. We've been through this COVID thing. I was talking with the pastors. You know, it's all so crazy right now. You know, we don't know what we're doing. We, you know, we, I'm a firm believer that a church is a repository. People give money to the church to do ministry with, not for us to have a bunch of CDs, right? You know, and just be, you know, well, the church got millions of dollars. What's the church doing millions of dollars? don't even make sense it's got to go people give so that it goes into somebody it goes into evangelism it goes into benevolence uh, you know um, thank God I've, I've seen times where we didn't have we didn't have ten thousand dollars in the bank and we took five thousand of it and gave it to a missionary and you know what God take care of it God takes care of it God said we don't take steps back I'm not taking a step back I don't care how I, I don't care. I, I tell everybody around here. I say, y'all see me riding a horse down the road. It's just because I, I sold the truck and give it to the church. I don't care, because I'm just telling you, God makes a way. What we're doing on this on, on this earth for the Lord matters. It matters, and it's worth giving. Old Garris Baggett says, pastored here at Mount Olive for so long. He said, I will never apologize for asking God's people to support God's work. Support God's will. I'm telling you, man, God, God will make it happen. We trying to get a school started. We do all this stuff. It's COVID. We got everybody scattered all over the place. We trying to keep up with this and keep up with that. I had a huge benevolent need the, uh, two days ago. Come in for for a little old widow. I mean, just in a bad way, getting took advantage of by by an insurance company and a bank. And uh, man, our, we, our staff got to working on it. And you know, and we, we 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 met that need. We had three college kids in Haiti. Uh, trying to get their last year of school done. And, you know, man, things are tight. And, man, I mentioned it out, and Lord help, had somebody come up and basically pay for the whole deal. Church picked up about, about a third of it, and they picked up two-thirds of it. And, man, we got them kids going back to school. They're going to finish their senior year. And, um, you know, it, it matters. And, um, uh, and, and you want to be balanced with it. Um, you can always have benevolence. You, you always have people you look after. God will always send you people to make to test your words. Don't tell. Don't say you won't be a loving church and then not have people that's hard to love. Don't say you're gonna be a giving church and not have people that have need. Amen. Amen. Don't say you're gonna be in a you're gonna be a life changing church and then not have people come tell you that their lives are so upside down it, it scared the Pope. <laughs> anyway, so. Was it was it verse verse nine? Y'all been talking so long that we're fifteen minutes, guys. We've read eight verses. I mean, for real, y'all gonna have to do better out there. Just y'all got to listen faster. 
Verse 9. Now a great many of the Jews knew that there that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but so that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now me and you'd want to see that too. Uh, but the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. You ought to underline that in your Bible. That's how this world thinks, right there. Jesus doesn't raise the brother up from the grave, and, and the world going to go around trying to put him back in a hole. You can't undo what God's doing. That's so stupid. Lord, help God. He's got to sit and just laugh at all the stuff that we're doing. In fact, you read Psalms 2. He said it's exactly what he's doing. Sitting, he's not only sitting in heaven and laughing at the way this world system works, but he's mocking it. And uh, look at some of the nonsense that... Uh, the, our, our leaders come up with nowadays. So they plotted to put old Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Well, no, duh. Jesus is saying he's son of God, reached down, calls a man from the grave. People knew he'd been dead for four days. So, you know, like Jesus said, if you don't believe me for the word's sake, y'all at least believe me for the work's sake. Who else is doing this? Anyway, so the next day, so it's Sunday. It's the Sunday before Easter. Palm Sunday, a great multitude that had come to the feast and moving towards the Passover feast had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And this is what they cried. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, of course, which was prophesied. And this Hosanna means save, Lord. Save. Um, uh, save, we pray. In other words, they're asking. They're asking, uh, they're asking the Lord for salvation, not in the sense that you and I would first think. They were looking for, like we do, they were looking for relief from their physical situation. These poor people. These are poor people that are being occupied by a foreign invader and being mistreated by their own leadership. And so they're, they, they believe that Messiah was going to come and set up a kingdom, which the Word of God said he would. The thing is, they saw the, the, the in the Old Testament, even the Jews to this day that that don't that aren't messianic, don't reach, don't receive Christ, still have this idea that when Messiah shows up, first thing he's going to do is set up a kingdom. Well, that's the first thing Jesus set up, but it was a spiritual kingdom. He he made that plain in his words. Um, the, we look from mountaintop to mountaintop in in prophecy, and a lot of the a lot of the the prophecies that the prom the prophet saw of seeing a suffering Messiah, which most a lot of people didn't see and don't see and don't want to look at, and they saw a, a Messiah that reigned nationally and threw off the oppressors. Well, that's what that's what me and you want to look at. I mean, even Christians, guys, to this day, what do, what do we want? We want to go to heaven. We want to go to heaven. We want to be out of here. We're tired of this stuff. We're tired of the pain. We're tired of the suffering. We're tired of the sickness. What we want to do? We want to be in heaven. Well, we're not there yet. Why? Because there's a, there's a road to walk. Well, Christ had a road to walk to bring us salvation before he set up any kind of political kingdom. But they're wanting a political king. That's why they kept trying to grab Jesus and make him king. And Jesus would slip away from him because it wasn't time. It wasn't time when he was quoting there, there in Nazareth when he was reading from Isaiah. And he's reading, right? And he says, you know, this day is this prophecy spoken, you know, or is being fulfilled in your ears. Well, if you go back and read that prophecy, Jesus cut off in mid-sentence. And he, he didn't talk about setting up judgment. He didn't come about talking about setting up the kingdom, which is the next thing it was said. But that's what they were want that's what they were wanting. They were wanting relief. They were wanting relief. You can't blame them. They're some of the poorest people that's ever lived. And um, I've been in some very poor places in the world. Very poor. Uh, I've been in the Manila dump. I've been in the West Bank in refugee camps. Uh, I've been out by the, some of the water people live there around the Philippines. Uh, I've been to Haiti. Uh, Haiti's the poorest place in the, on this hemisphere. And, uh, and you're trying to talk to people about what will change there forever. And they're so hungry that all they want is the dollars in your pocket. And I've been with people before. They're like, man, they're, they're missing it. I said, they're missing it because they're hungry. I said, what you got to do is give all the money out of your pocket so that they know you don't have any more physical resource and then tell them what, 
what you're there for and what's about. And those that are being called and those that God's given an ear for, they'll they'll get it. But everybody else will just go because they're they're just they're just hung physically. That's why this crowd of people that's praising Jesus by Friday, a lot of them are hollering crucify him, right? Because he wasn't doing what they wanted. We do that a lot with God. God doesn't do what we want, so well, we're not gonna follow him. I see I see this happen people all the time. As long as God's doing what they want, they want to follow God. It's like they're making a deal. God doesn't make deals. In fact, God will sometimes let you get to the end of a deal just so that you recognize that's not who he is. Anyway, hope it's making sense. So when Jesus had found a young donkey and sat on it as it's written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming sitting on a, on a donkey's coat. Well, go, you can read the, the synoptic gospels and they'll tell you about that story where Jesus told his disciples how to go get that donkey. But he came in humbly. He came in humbly. That's, there, there's your picture. He comes in on this little donkey, on this little, on the foal of this mama donkey. So, you know, if you read, the, you'll see there's two of them, right? There's a mama and a foal. Nobody had ever sat on it. And Jesus comes riding that donkey and it's a symbol of peace. Anyway. Of course, the, the scriptures say, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, setting on a donkey's colt, which is, of course, a fulfillment of scripture. His disciples didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, so John's moving us ahead, right? Then they remembered that these things were written about him, that they had done these things to him. One of the things you got to remember is that they weren't filled with the Spirit yet, and it's the Spirit that gives us understanding into spiritual things. Um, I was thinking about something else. Maybe I'll talk about it next week. We talk about the Last Supper. Anyway, therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. Amen. That's part of the reason the crowd was there. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So there were certain Greeks among those who came, and there's a lot more to be read about that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know, go back and read it today if you get a chance. This, that's where Jesus, they said, you, Master, you need to tell these people, these kids to be quiet, because they were calling him Son of God, and Son of Christ. You need to tell them to be quiet. He said, if they got quiet, the rocks would cry. Jesus never tells people quit worshiping him. When you went in doubt, worship. So there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast, and probably in bed, uh, Hellenists, they called him. Uh, then they came to Philip, right, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee. They might have knew him. Right? This is not this ain't Philip the deacon that's coming along later. This is Philip the, the disciple. And asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I got a good friend that's had that etched into the pulpit he preaches behind for years. Sir, we would see Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. And uh, that's that's what he always, he has that in front of him so he can remind himself. That's what people need. They need to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Now, they start talking, but Jesus starts saying something else. Jesus answered, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He said, Now I'm coming to that time, most assuredly. Oh, King James says, verily, verily. Truly, truly. You always catch that when he says most assuredly. I've talked about it. He said he's hitting a double. I've talked about it in first and second, as we read through the first and second time. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. That's what he's, 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 he's using a parable here. If I stay where I'm at, I'm not going to bring salvation I need to bring, but I'm going to go die. And just like grain going into the ground, that seed's going to die in that ground, but it's going to bring forth a whole crop. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life, living with an eternal perspective. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. That's where I always want to be. I always want to be where Jesus is at. I always want to be around the people I think Jesus would be around. Um, don't get too uppity in this world. Even if the Lord's raised you up to high places, um, if you'll find yourself ministering to the lowly, then whenever God wants somebody that he's going to send along to help exalt you or whatever, he'll send them along. 
most most pastors, those of y'all that are preachers that may be listening, uh, they're not remembered on this earth. It doesn't mean that their ministry is not, doesn't mean anything. Nobody's going to remember who I am. Um, but if you're where Christ would have you, if you're where Christ would be, and I would just encourage you this, whether if you're listening from another church or a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or whatever, you make certain that there are places in your life, your life group, your Sunday school class, your church, where the people that are the hardest to love and who have the greatest need, um, make sure that they're, they're, you're doing things specifically for and to them. Make certain that you are ministering to people at no cost to them. A set of people that, that have no possible way of paying you back. You make you make a place for it. I have I have preached, and I preach every month, Lord willing. I preach every month at Street Church, every month, every month, every month. I am going to make certain that I got my hands. I don't care how bad COVID is. I am going to be holding the hand and hugging the neck of somebody that's trying to come off them streets or is caught in crack cocaine addiction or is selling herself out in prostitution for the lowest of prices. You've got to make certain that you are where the master would be. I don't care how well degreed you are or how well you're paid at your church. And I'm glad for you. you know, there's, there's a place, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. You just make certain that there are people that you're pouring into that have there's no earthly way that they can pour anything back into you. You don't give your shoes to somebody that's got shoes. You give your shoes to somebody that's got none and can never bring you another pair to replace them. Anyway. Uh, I'm giving away a mini pair of boots, many a pair of shoes, just talking about it. And you know what I got on my, my shoes right now? I got to show it to you. There they are. Ostrich skin boots. You know what? It was given to me. Hmm. Is that funny? <laughs> I give away a plain old pair of black shoes. Two weeks later, God sends me some ostrich boots. Yeah. Yeah. Deal with that. And some of you folks from the city, you like, what's that guy? What's that guy showed me his boot? Well, sorry about the mud all over. Anyhow. Now, my soul is troubled, he says. Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. In other words, I want, I want, Father, I want you to, I want to be where you want me to be. And I'm here to do it. And he's, he was as human as me and you, so he, knew, he wanted deliverance in the hour. He's going to pray that in Gethsemane. But he prays that his name would be glorified. He prayed that out loud. Catch this. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I'll glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. What well, Jesus says, this voice didn't come because of me, but for your sake. It didn't come so I'd hear it. Encourage me because I'm always in communion with the Father. This is saying y'all hear. It's so y'all know who I am. Now is the judgment of this world. And now is the ruler of this world be cast out. Talk about the devil. And, it, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. So we know he's talking about the cross. If I'm lifted up on that cross, I'll draw all men to me. And that's the calling point. And there ain't greater words ever been spoken. The people answered him, we have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. And now you say the Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is this Son of Man? They're, they're really thinking we heard that the anointed one lasts forever. This prophet, priest, and king. Why are you saying he's going to be lifted up? How are you going? What do you mean by death? Who's this son of man? Jesus always called himself son of man. Jesus said, a little while longer the light's with you. Walk while you have the light. Lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light. That you may become the sons of light. And he was talking to them about him being in the world right then. Same thing happens when God calls you. 
if you're really considering the claims of Christ, you would say to me right now, Preacher, I, I can't say that I really know Christ as my Savior. I mean, I have an idea about Christ. I've heard about him. I've got thoughts about him, but I, I'm getting understanding. Well, that's light. And you got to walk and you got to you got to respond while you got light. The opportunity of a lifetime, they say, only exists within the lifetime of the opportunity. The opportunity only lasts a little while, and then it goes away. And when it goes away, there's no there's darkness. And when what Jesus is saying is when you walk in the darkness, you don't know where you're going. The, the heart is deceitful, the Bible says, above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? People are running around trying to chase right, doing a lot of wrong in the name of right. There's people committing out and out sin that are absolutely abominations uh, in the Word of God that think they're doing right things. We 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 have a lot of ways that make us. Uh, uh, I seen a man one time starve the kids, thinking that he was helping them be disciplined. Yeah, yeah. I said, Brother Todd, that's crazy. You ain't kidding. Little boy. We was forever. My aunt had him at the home, at her home. She had him there a good while. And uh, it was foster parents. And the little boy was forever getting him to quit holding food in his jaws. He, he looked like a little chipmunk. And you'd have to tell him, Bubba, you can swallow that. There's more coming. You wouldn't believe him. And he'd eat and he'd act like he, he wasn't holding it in his jaws, but he was, this is a two-year-old. You tell me what they've been through by somebody thinking they were doing right. And somebody, this this couple thought that the whole world was attacking them for their beliefs when they took them kids from them. Thank God they took them from them. We do a lot of wrong thinking we're doing right. When you got light and you got an opportunity, you need to seize it. God's calling you to get saved. You need to jump on it. You don't know how long that'll last. And besides that, I ain't here to scare you. If the Lord's going to tear his coming a thousand years and you're going to live every day of it and God's going to call you for a thousand years, why would you live without Jesus for a thousand years? Just to get saved in the end. Everybody wants to do that. I want to live like hell and I want to go to heaven at the end. You don't want a Savior. You don't want a real Savior. You don't want a real relationship. Um, I'm going to tell you something. If, you, if, you'll, if you'll really consider Christ, you'll find that he's worth loving more than things in this world are worth loving. Just saying. You can hear me or you can't. Again, you got light, you can hear me. If you don't, you can't. I have preached my tongue tired, my throat sore, trying to talk to unwilling people for so many years. Trying to convince them. Cried and laughed and hollered and screamed. And Lord, I've probably even threatened a time or two. I got news. If you can't hear, you won't hear. If you don't want to hear, you don't, and you don't want to come, you don't have to. I'm, I'm just telling you, man, God's been faithful to me. I wouldn't have kept me all this time. Wouldn't have. No way. Uh, I'm going to tell you, if you ever hear old Todd Peavy tell you anything, you hear this, you come to Jesus if you've got a chance to. Uh, you need to ask right Jesus right now. Just ask him, save your soul. Just say, Lord, save me. It'd be enough. He'll know. Tell him you believe he died for you. I can give you all kinds of things you all say theologically correct, but I'm going to tell you something. Old thief dying on the cross said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I'm telling you, pray that and see what God don't do. So, what time is it? 35 minutes. Tell you what, I'm going to end there. These things Jesus spoke and was departed and was hidden from him. We're going to pick back up on verse 37 next week because I'm going to leave you with that thought. If you got light, you can use it. Christian, you are a person of the light. I tell you, this whole world is getting dark. Darker, darker, darker. More and more nonsense. More and more pressure. More and more big swallowing up little. Uh, we need to be people of light in it. And if you don't know Christ, you call out to him. Let us know. Uh, Jesus said, if you'll confess me for me, and I'll confess you for my Father in heaven. If you live on the other side of the planet, we'll try to help you get into a church somewhere. 
We got folks all over America since this COVID-19 thing went out. And I started doing these victory minutes, putting preaching out there on, on online. We got people all over the world watching. Some of them have to get what I'm saying right now translated. And it's weird. It's scurry, Texas. Um, our, our church address is Victory Church. Dot ch all one word and uh, if you'll get on there there's some way or another you can contact us now I, I can't tell you all the technological stuff but I got people here that can, that can do it um, trying to think I tell you what if you pray and you ask Jesus to save you I'm going to give you a phone number to text just text it it's uh Four six nine eight three eight five three two one. Now don't hold me to that. I think that's the number. I'm doing this off the top of my head. Just text to that number and say, I asked Jesus to save me during Pathways. And we'll try to send you back some information. I'm pretty sure my folks can, can get that. I'll tell you what else. If you'll text the word loop, I know that sounds silly, L-O-O-P. That'll get you signed up for um, a meet and deal with me and a kind of a beginning class. But even if you can't be here, uh, if, if you can do that, it'll, it'll hit on that system. And then they're going to come say, hey, Brother Todd, we got this guy from Santa Monica, California, or wherever, you know, other side of the world, Siberia. And he's wanting to go to this class. And now he wants to do this class. He has Christ to be a savior, and he gets some information to him or her. That good? My phone number, by the way, is 469-595-1998. Text me up. Now, either text me or leave me a message because I'll be screening phone calls. I get numbers from all this spamming stuff all the time, and my number's out there on the Internet. I got some folks that's aggravated with me. But if you call, leave a message And uh, if I don't answer. And, uh, or just shoot me a text, and I'll try to help you if I can. I'm just, I'm just a hick from... I live in a little town called Rosser. But uh, I do everything I can to help you. I'm telling you, Jesus is worth following. And I hope you have a good day. For all you members, regular attenders, Victory Church, just keep it up. Let's jump into verse 37 next week. See y'all later. Bye-bye.